Great. Dave. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming. This uh, was originally a presentation I did for the Cal Nevada conference, um, but I thought it might be interesting for those that weren't able to attend to, to see it here. So uh, a little bit modified, a little bit customized for us. There's a lot of slides, um, so bear with me there, but I hope you have fun. All right. Let's get started. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, basically, I'm going to kind of walk you through a history of, of meters uh, and meters at East Bay Mud. Since I'm in the conservation department, I'll talk about the history of water conservation as it relates to metering, which are very inter inter intertwined. And I'm going to talk about uh, some future projects that we're working on. So you know, why are we talking about meters? Before, before public water systems were developed, water was sold by vendors by the bucket, barrel, or other common units of measurement. The first water systems charged customers a flat rate based on a number of factors like number of fireplaces, number of rooms, number of occupants, or size. None of these were particularly useful in determining the actual amount of water consumed, and the water system managers constantly warned of water being wasted. Um, they generally knew how much water they were selling, but they couldn't compare their consumption to uh, how many people were actually in the home. Um, and per capita consumption is obviously affected by a variety of factors. So they needed a water managers needed a better way of, of uh, managing their daily needs. Um, I'm not going to read through all these bullets here, but uh, here's a little background in case um, you know some of you forgot. Um, some key factors were. Um, of course, East Bay Mud was formed in 1924. So prior to that, uh, some key factors were the first water system in our area was in 1958. Uh, the People's Water Company uh, came about in 1906. And East Bay Water, our predecessor, our direct predecessor, was in 1917. Um, so the Contra Costa Water Company uh, started in 1866 and basically wrapped up in 1898. Um, Anthony Chabot established the company uh, in Oakland. Um, and rates at that time were based on a, a, the square footage of the homes. So you paid a buck 75 for a 600 square foot home or about three bucks a month for a 1200 square foot home. Plus you paid an extra quarter for every story or extra person above five. So there was a surcharge of a dollar for a uh, bathtub, 50 cents per toilet. And if you had a garden, it was 25, uh, 50 cents for 25 feet of uh, frontage. There was extra costs for horses and carriage or, or borders. And the typical bill averaged about five or seven bucks. Um, <clears throat> let's move on. Um, Peepus Water Company, established in 1906, uh, passed after a bond measure and acquiring many of the smaller companies to merge or be acquired. Um, and it services water from as far north as Richmond and down to Hayward. Uh, in 1906, of course, we had the great earthquake in San Francisco and a bunch of fires that followed. And so there was a large migration to the Oakland area from the East Bay, rather. Um, uh, and in 1909, the People's Water Company built the Central Reservoir, just to give you a little timeline there. And it was about this time in 1909 that we first uh, really started installing a lot of meters. There was a water crisis amongst our ancestors uh, in, in 1907 to 1918. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are noticing the picture on the right, um, which is in our, its name was Mud Book, of uh, folks in 1918 responding to the Spanish flu. But also during this period, um, our uh, gallons per capita day, GPCD, fell from 109 to 55. And that was primarily due to uh, metering charges. Um, we also started charging extra for people that did night watering. And, um, and just to give you this perspective, in 1906, our population served was about 170,000. A mere eight years later, it rose to 320,000. So we were in an era of very rapid growth. And of course, capped in 1917, when we entered World War I, the water demand shot up and it became very important to focus our, uh, company's, our country's attention on the war efforts. And then to top it off after the war, the 1918 Spanish flu. So it was a very interesting period. The East Bay water uh, started in 1916 after the People's Water Company went bankrupt due to poor financing. Um, some big accomplishments for the People's Water Company was to reduce the capital, uh, reduce their uh, system demand, uh, comp excuse me, GPCD demand, um, and by mostly by uh, introducing meters. 
Um, at this time, Oakland is no longer a small bucolic farming community, but an industrial powerhouse with cotton mills, factories, manufacturing, railroad, um, shipyards, and of course, uh, going into uh, World War I, as I mentioned. So in doing some research, one of the things I ran across are some old ledgers that tell the story. The ledger on the left from 1907 from the Richmond Water Company, later to be acquired by People's Water Company, shows uh, just a, a, a flat rate charge for this customer. Uh, uh, in contrast, this ledger from 1917 by the East Bay Water Company shows uh, clearly a volumetric charge. And this shows the period that we were transitioning to metering. I couldn't tell you the exact date and time um, when we installed a particular meter, but um, you can see that this is sometime in this period. Here are some cool photos from the East Bay Water Company um, in the early 20s, uh, including crews getting ready to go to work. And um, what particular interest to me is the, the meter shop in the right-hand corner. Um, in 1921, California finally passed the MUD Act, and um, and and San Francisco and East Bay become became some of the last major communities in the West that didn't have publicly owned water districts. So in 1924, of course, East Bay MUD was formed by um, our former governor and political heavyweight George Pardee, uh, who became our first uh, board of directors president. After the district was formed, however, um, we basically had no distribution system, we had no water supply, no staff, and no money. Um, and the existing distribution system was, was a haphazard mix of, of two-inch redwood pipes and other uh, older facilities, and we had a 24% loss due to leakage. Um, in 1928, the East Bay Water Company is fully sold, acquired, and all set up through East Bay Mud after a five-year delay. Um, Let's get to the next slide. Uh, one of the major events was the construction of the Pardee Dam early in our history from 1927 to 1929. But it wasn't just the dam, it also the project also consisted of construction of filter plants, distribution mains, local reservoirs, and tunnels. Uh, finally, in uh, June 23rd in 1929, water began flowing from Pardee uh, into the San Pablo Dam. At this time, East Bay Mud had about 460,000 uh, residents um, using about 40 million gallons of water, and there were about 436 employees. So it was very lucky that we were able to uh, fill the Party Dam so quickly because we had a very bad drought in 1931 to 1933. And without this reservoir and without the meters that we had in place, it would not have been possible for us to meet the water demands. Um, and there's another demand, another big drought occurred in 59, 1959 to 1961. So, um, you know, looking back in 1928, we were uh, fully metered and under full swing as we were getting out uh, from underneath our debt and expanding very rapidly. This rate sheet shows the various um, rates over the years. And you'll notice that even back in 1928, we had tiered rates that with a combination of fixed and volumetric charges. And this was part of our system even way back when. 1936 was a big year for us. Um, we were rapidly expanding. We started serving 2 million gallons a day to the Standard Oil Chevron refinery and 2 million gallons to CNH Sugar. This required building miles of new transmission mains and other facilities. Um, this meter in particular was one of our original meters from the Chevron uh, refinery that was recently replaced. It was actually installed in 1936 and still operated well to my surprise. Unfortunately, parts are no longer available for this meter and uh, it's not uh, AMI compatible. So it was replaced with a new compound meter that had AMI. Um, from 1936 to 1946, East Bay Mud grew from a population of 517,000 of 850,000, and our demand went from 41 to 110 MGD. So this meter in particular is a Lambert meter made by the Thompson Metering Company in 1936. The Lambert meter dates back to 1891, where the Tom Bert, Thomas uh, Thompson Meter Company formed uh, with uh, French machinist Frank Lambert as president. Although they got bought out by Neptune in 1925, they continued to make Lambert meters into the 30s, and we still have some others in our system. So World War II brought rapid changes to the district. Um, women began serving as meter readers during World War II, and um, although the meter shop appears to be largely still men in those year, in this picture. 
Uh, here they are looking at a batch of Neptune meters. Um, with the high demands of World War II, conservation was encouraged to save water, chemicals, and energy for the war. In the summer of 1945, uh, it was a particularly hot summer. It sh uh, demand shot up to 152 million gallons a day. Um, as I mentioned, East Bay Mud grew about 300,000 people and 53 million gallons a day through the war. And the boom continued after the war, although it, it uh, settled down to about 110 MGD in 46, as I mentioned previously. Um, in 1976 and 1977, we had one of the worst droughts in our history, probably the worst drought. And it was a pivotal moment for East Bay Mud and California history. Um, in 1976, Pardee was at 60% of normal, and in 1977, it was at 19% of normal. We pumped about 25,000 acre feet from the Delta. And after this uh, severe drought, it took us about six years for our demand to creep back up to its uh, rate of 210 million gallons a day. Uh, in 1991, um, we switched to, to digital format. We used electronic handhelds and meter reads to make meter reading more efficient, and accurate. This is a photo, I think this is Karen Lewis, our former meter reader supervisor. Um, and in 2001, we installed our first iTron ERT for remote reading. And so that was kind of exciting for me because these are um, the beginnings of AMI. So you all may be wondering why somebody like me in water conservation is so interested in meters. These are the most powerful tools in our toolbox in water conservation. Um, most of them folks think it's just an operations tool, but the meters uh, documented first use of meters occurred in ancient Rome in the first century AD by, I'm going to mispronounce this, Frontinus, the water commissioner. At that time, pipes were solid lead. A long time had passed uh, since then, and da Vinci took a stab at designing a water meter in the 16th century, um, although not, I don't think anything was done with his design until much later. Um, England became an early adopter of water meters in 1825, but they really didn't start showing up in the U.S. until the middle of, uh, until about 1850. Siemens was one of the first commercially available meters um, in 1852, and they're, they're still making meters to this day. Our first meters, as I mentioned, were probably in the 1900s, early 1900s, and currently we have meters in uh, range in size from 5 eighths inch to 20 inches. I think it's interesting that even to this day, there are still uh, cities that don't are not fully metered. So we use a wide variety of meters at East Bay Mud, with many different types. The meters basically fall into four different types, the, the volumetric, inferential, static, and mixed. I'm gonna give you some examples in case you aren't all familiar with these meters like I am. So the nutating disc is probably our most common meter uh, in the US. And as you can see from this video, water flows um, uh, causes the disc to sort of rotate or, or wobble or nutate, as they call it, on the shaft, um, producing a rotation. Uh, this rotation then in turn drives some gears in the meter register. And, and uh, um, let's see, and um, these, these meters are reliable um, as much as 1% for sizes up to two inches. Um, the nutating disc were actually invented in 1830 uh, by James and Edward uh, Dyqueen. Um, the Dyqueens were granted a patent for a pump using this principle. Um, Sewell, on the right here, patented this rotary meter in 1850, and became it became commercially viable in 1877. It was later improved and sold by companies like Worthington, and who eventually became Amco. In the early 1900s, um, these meters were improved um, and, and the disc began to be made of hard rubber. By combining the hard rubber on brass, the life of the meter was greatly extended. Um, and this design was actually uh, uh, used up until 1950s when the brass meter uh, body was replaced with plastic. Uh, piston meters or rotary piston meters were first introduced in the early to mid 1800s. However, these early designs were not as uh, durable. Um, when they improved the meter, the basic design became uh, what is what we use today. Um, so here's another shot of an oscillating piston. Um, um, as I mentioned, uh, well, as you can tell, uh, it doesn't really have a wobble. The the meter moves around in a common in a in a single plane. Um, it, it, we don't use very many of these. They tend to be a bit noisy. 
Um, velocity meters such as single jets and turbines have been around a, a long time in various forms. They grew out of the current or, or stream meters from, um, from originating in 1790 and credited to uh, Reinhard Wolfmann in Germany. In the 1850s, one of these first commercial meters was produced by Siemens. Um, turbine meters are designed for high flow with low head loss, but they're less accurate um, at lower flows. You might see this uh, meter used on large irrigation sites like golf courses or cemeteries, and they're also used as a part of compound meters, which we'll talk about in a second. The Venturi meter was primarily used for uh, large plants and very large customer meters due to its low head loss and essentially maintenance-free operation. It is not as useful at low flows for or for smaller meters. Um, East Bay Mud also uses, utilize the short body vent versions of these Venturis for compact operations. Um, the Venturi had some applications and, and has for many years, but it's been found to have some limitations and possible errors, especially with the short body meters. So East Bay Mud has uh, lately been replacing those with mag meters. Um, I promised you I was going to talk about compound meters. Here's one. The compound meter combines uh, a turbine uh, in this area um, to measure the high flow and a positive displacement meter to measure the low flow. The first compound meter was actually uh, dates back to 1903 and in uh, were, they were sold by uh, Neptune and the Trident meter as early as 1909. This is just an example of the water flow going through the meter. I'm just going to flip back to the previous screen just so you remember. Um, this part here is the, the, the smaller chamber, and this is the larger chamber, and there's a valve that decides where the water is going to go. Um, an acoustic meter. Well, also known as, I call them ultrasonic meters. Um, they use the speed of sound in the water to measure water velocity. When the sound moves in the direction of the water flow, it goes slightly faster. And when it goes opposite the water flow, it's slower. The difference in time travel is used to accurately measure the flow rate. It's like when you, you snap your fingers with your eyes closed, your brain uses the sound uh, to determine where your snap was, if because I heard it in my right ear before my left ear. Same thing, same principles applied in the meter. A mag meter uses a physical principle known as Faraday's law. Um, of electromagnetic induction to calculate the flow rate. Basically, when the ions in the water move through a magnetic field, they produce an electric current. The bigger the current, the faster the flow. Let's look at this graphic for a second. As ions are moving through the, the, the magnetic field marked with the red and blue, um, they produce an electromotor force, basically a voltage. Um, that force is then summed up to calculate uh, what the flow rate is. It's a very simple principle, and uh, many of our newer meters use this. So there's really five main types of meter registers. The meter register was originally integrated into the meter with a, a shaft that um, the meter drove a shaft that then went to the gears that drove individual dials. This uh, round dial meter was the older meter styles. I find them particularly hard to read myself. Um, the first magnetically driven sealed registers where the register is a separate component uh, were commercially viable in around 1956. And with this design often came a numerical wheel or what they call digital uh, meter. It's not electronic, it's digital, but, um, and I find these obviously much more easier to read. The white dials in this case are our billing units and these black dials are, are the smaller increments are we call odd feet. Um, the first patented remote meters actually date back to 1917, although widespread use came much uh, later. The pulse type register, one of the meters used in this system, is shown here. Um, it came out in 1957, and it produces a pulse that could then be uh, captured by a data logger or a meter with a data logger. Um, the first encoded registers, like this one, uh, came out in 1964. This meter actually reads the the dial, the digital dial that we talked about before, as opposed to just producing counted pulses. That's what we use now. Um, solid state meters, like the one, the registers like the one shown here, um, are more common lately, and they feature no moving parts, obviously less drag, no gears to move around, and they can transmit very small digits, very high resolution, good for AMI. So we've used a lot of uh, meter manufacturers over the years. Some here's are some screenshots, some of our common meters. Um, 
Southeast history. Um, one thing to consider is meters were never cheap. Uh, here's a bid page from 1914. Um, as you can see, we were paying about nine bucks for a five eighth inch trident meter. Um, in today's dollars, that's about $235. Um, I'm pretty sure it did not include an AMI endpoint at this price point. It looks like in this year we bought the full line of uh, Trident meters, as you can tell from the shot of our um, of our meter warehouse back then. Uh, one of the things I like to look at are tap maps. East Bay Mud has kept excellent records over the years, and uh, this tap map, for example, shows um, original connection back in 1877. It's at the top here. It says People's Water Company, but um, back then. It was the Contra Costa Water Company, so I, there must have been an overlay here um, because the People's Water Company didn't come out until 1906. Um, this tap map I found pretty interesting. Um, it um, There's a photo of the meter that's in the ground, and best I can tell, this is the original meter that was installed. Um, the Note the meter number here is only five, uh, five digits, so we must not have had that many meters when this one was installed in 1910. Um, Tap maps are also useful in providing information about the meters. According to this tap map, this six inch service was installed in 1922, um, and the meter that was installed was a Trident Protector Fire Service meter. At the time, this building was the Zellerbach Paper Company. It is now a Salvation Army. And I went out there and looked at this meter, and there it is. Um, they currently use this meter for fire service at the uh, 7th and Franklin. And it probably weighs, I think, according to Jeff, he estimated 1,000 pounds. And uh, it still works, so we don't change it out. Um, Neptune is our most common meter at, the, at East Bay Mud. Um, they started selling uh, these meters in 1892. And it, Neptune boasted in 1909, I'll read this quote, a record of over 600,000 Trident meters made and sold give, a, give to us the preeminent position among water meter manufacturers. That same year, they came out with their first compound meter. The Trident, which is the mechanical gear-driven meter you're, just, you're, you're seeing, uh, continued uh, this design until a similar design until the 60s when they switched to the mag meter. I guess they called it the tri-seal back then. Um, and they, as I mentioned before, they came out with their first absolute encoder in 1964. Our first AMR device, uh, automatic, uh, excuse me, advanced, uh, what do they call it? automatic meter reading device, was on a Neptune meter in, as I mentioned, in 2001. Hersey water meter. Um, they started making meters uh, back in 1886. Um, they were sometimes known as Hersey Sparling or the Mueller Company. Um, I found this advertisement I found interesting. We still have a few of these meters, uh, not this design, but Hersey meters in our system. Um, the Census Rockwell meter, also known as uh, well, Rockwell or Pittsburgh, it's more commonly known historically as the Keystone meter. Um, they were, uh, Pittsburgh was founded in 1921 and the name changed to Rockwell in 45. Uh, as early as 57, they had their first mag driven meter with a sealed register. And in 1889, uh, 19, excuse me, in 1989, they uh, changed their name uh, to the familiar to us census. And we have a census advanced metering infrastructure system now. Uh, in 2017, census got bought out by Xylem, but they still are largely referred to as census. The Badger, Badger water meter. Badger started in 1905 in Milwaukee, uh, advertising a frost-proof meter, which of course in that area was very important. Badger uh, grew very quickly, but in the depression, they were, almost went bankrupt and they were saved by um, uh, a large order from all places, Mexico City. Um, their Readomatic meter shown here came out in 1963, and this is one of our first remote registers. Um, uh, we used the Readomatic meter um, till not too long ago to read uh, some basements. I should say uh, we did one of our first uh, AMR pilots in water conservation with the Badger Orion system, which was a, a great system that read meters as, as down to the minute. Um, in California, water utilities like East Bay Mud started installing meters in the early 1900s. The use of meters had a dramatic impact right away on per capita water consumption, as shown in this article I dug up from 1912. 
Um, East Bay water, as we were known at that time, is not shown here, but the Los Angeles uh, is, and it shows a decrease in per capita water consumption from 306 gallons per capita day in 1901 to 140 with the installation of 64,000 meters. Um, let's see, I'm having a little, uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, this article, uh, it talks about the importance of water supply, and uh, I think I highlighted the text, uh, and it's hard to read, but in, in this, I'll try. In this fully metered city, it is impossible to compare the total pumpage or supply with the total registration of all meters. The amount remaining unaccounted for is, of course, the most um, <clears throat> reliable criterion of leakage which is possible to obtain. And occasionally we find a city with practically every service metered, but accounting for only 50% to 60% of its total supply. The manager of such a plant should entertain no delusion as to the effic efficiency of his administration. Either he has underground leakage or there is, or there is stealing from his mains and the one cost as much as the other. I find this interesting because we're still talking about this same issue more than a hundred years later. In 1922, uh, our water loss was estimated at 27%, but by 1934, it was only 14%. Uh, I love this photo. It's a, uh, taken from an exhibit in 1921 at the Berkeley Merchants Fair, where East Bay Mud staff had a booth advertising um, the new upcoming San Pablo meter project, or excuse me, San Pablo um, uh, water treatment plant project and reservoir. And uh, what I find so interesting is that they're demonstrating in this photo how to read a meter. Uh, we do that to this day. I work several times at the Lafayette Art and Wine Festival, and I talk to customers about upcoming projects and how to read their meter. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting, I'm going to read an interesting quote from um, uh, John Longwell, our former uh, general manager of years ago. Every now and then, someone wants to know why the district doesn't sell water under a flat rate rather than a meter rate system. Under a flat rate, the consumer pays a certain fixed sum per month and uses and wastes as much water as he pleases. Under meter rates, the consumer pays for the amount of water he uses and wastes. Therefore, he doesn't deliberately waste water. Water in cities where people don't have their own wells is a commodity, which one buys just as one buys his groceries. What would happen if a grocer were asked to, to give his customers monthly flat rate on the groceries he sells? If a grocer did that, it wouldn't be long before he'd go flat broke if he hadn't made his flat rate mighty high. For of course, his customers paying flat rates would patronize him high and wide and handsome, so to speak. The people of Sacramento and Fresno pay flat rates for their water furnished by cities. The result, of course, is that practically everybody wastes water in these cities as inebriated seamen are currently said to squander their money. Why shouldn't they waste water? It didn't cost them anything to do it. I just quote cracks me up. We're still having the same arguments today. Um, back in 1974, we had a great water conservation comic um, that is still available on our website, Captain Hydro. Um, I guess uh, Bob Johnson dressed up and, and did this uh, this comic. What's interesting is um, part of this comic is talking about how to read your water meter. So water conservation gets formalized um, with the water conservation master plan. As I ex explained previously, because of the main reservoir supply, uh, water conservation has always been a part of East Bay Mud's history. Demand management, including water conservation, has been an important piece of the district's water supply planning and and policy since the 70s. The district prepared its first urban water master plan in 1985, which included a list of water conservation efforts designed to save 18 million, gallon, 18 million gallons per day in the year 2005. The Water Conservation Division was established in 1986 to implement the 1985 uh, urban water management plan conservation efforts and the years of the program focused uh, in the early years of the program focused on establishing water audits and device distribution programs, preparing educational materials to encourage water conservation and developing and, pro and promoting the adoption of landscape guidelines for new construction with the district service area. Whew, that was a lot. Um, so I, one thing I will say is that, you know, we, we far exceeded our goals. By 2018, we'd already saved uh, 46 million gallons a day compared with what we had hoped to save, which was 33 million gallons per day. Um, one of the questions we're asking with meters is, where is the water loss? Uh, with meter accuracy, we're looking at apparent losses in this uh, familiar chart. 
um, looking at a water supply. Um, auditing. Uh, so in 1918, uh, I found this interesting uh, article from Bubbles Magazine. That was the splashes of East Bay Water Company. Um, uh, this is a meter testing apparatus, and and basically what they're doing is they're running, they're filling a tank with known volume from this meter here. Um, in 1933, we got a little bit more sophisticated with our meter testing. Um, we started uh, putting multiple meters in line to save uh, so we could do more at a time. We brought in multiple tanks, and these uh, fi finely dressed gentlemen are uh, evaluating the accuracy of these what look like Neptune meters. In 1940, we got even more uh, automated with our meter testing in multiple tanks. We were able to test more meters faster, and this rotometer is going all the way down to a quarter gallon per minute flow. Um, in 19, and uh, we modified the bench circa around 2014 uh, to actually get down to even lower flows. Uh, we modified this in a very sophisticated way. We put a, a needle valve on the end of the discharge tube and measured the flow rate with a, a graduated cylinder. Um, just was to a special job to related to uh, one of my favorite projects, the unmeasured flow project. In 2018, we, uh, we got much more sophisticated. Uh, we installed a new bench. We now had the capability of testing meters of many different sizes, including up to 24 meters simultaneously through a fully automated bench. We have both um, uh, gravimetric means of uh, weighing the water uh, and, and excuse me, and um, volumetric uh, volume size of the water. Uh, we are actually recirculating the water that we test so we don't waste too much. We've got five tanks all the way up to 300 cubic feet and all the way down to half a cubic foot in size. We are also able to measure very precisely uh, down to a 40th gallon per minute with this uh, meter on this uh, rotometer here. Um, here's an example of some work that we did looking at meters. Um, this meter, I took all the gears and whatnot apart so you could just see the spindle. And this is a meter that was incredibly accurate at a 30 second gallon per minute. You can see the little shaft moving ever so slowly. Not all meters are this good. By contrast, here's a meter at a half a gallon per minute that didn't pass. And we took it apart to try and figure out what was happening. Um, you can see the shaft here um, uh, kind of wobbly, kind of moving intermittently, and that's a failing meter. It, if you had gears on top of this, it probably would have been uh, attached to it. It probably wouldn't have been a lot worse. Um, all of these metering projects has made me realize the importance of customer leaks, and I'm going to dive into this. This is an actual billboard that we had in the last route. Um, here's a leak that's identified by an AMI or advanced metering infrastructure. Those are our smart meters. Um, you can see that um, the, our system has pulled out that uh, there's a usage never goes below what is represented in the orange uh, piece here. That's a, a it, it's a leak. Um, I put together all my experience, put together like a top ten list. Uh, Dave, Dave, uh, Dave, not Letterman, but Wallenstein's top ten list of leaks. At the top is irrigation valves that are stuck open. And then by toilets, and we've seen them all, but um, this is kind of a, a most common list. Love the whatchamacallits. It's that that appliance in your house that just you know does this or that it is somehow broken. Here's a, a leak at my house um, on my hose bib, um, and I'm reading it every minute. And one thing you know I learned about leaks is that they're not always constant. We're we're at the top of a hill in our zone, and our pressure often influences. Uh, how, what the flow rate is and other factors that um, I can see that the, the, the little dribble that goes through um, a meter. Here's an example of what one quarter gallon per minute looks like. This is an important uh, uh, rate because um, meters are often tested or brand new or required to be tested at a quarter gallon per minute for accuracy. But as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty good flow. I could wash my hands with this flow rate. Here's an eighth of a gallon per minute. And here's a drop. This is doesn't sound like much, but it's 10 gallons a, a day. And what's important about this is no meter is going to read this. So, you, you know, free water. Um, as meters, uh, our studies here in the, like the unmeasured flow show that uh, as meters uh, are on the low end of their flow regime, they're less accurate. In fact, it kind of follows a log normal uh, curve. 
um, the slower the flow, the less the accuracy. And of course, the larger meters are even less accurate at low flows. Um, why does this matter? Well, if we're not able to measure these low flow leaks, we're losing money. For example, an eighth of a gallon per minute is 180 gallons a day, seven units a month, and about $44 a month on today's dollars. If the meter is only designed to be accurate at a quarter gallon per minute, then we could be losing a portion of this uh, flow rate. And certainly as the flow goes down, you can see the problem. Um, flow rates change by season. This is a study from the Unmeasured Flow uh, Project where we looked at customers' flow rates. And uh, as we expected, the lower in the winter months, um, there's lower flow. It's a little complicated to look at this chart because it's the percentage of flow below a certain flow rate. So um, I put a line here at a quarter gallon per minute and quite a bit of the flow is actually below that quarter gallon per minute, which is our meter accuracy. Obviously it's a bigger problem in the winter than in the summer. Um, so meters and AMI and conservation. Um, I'm very excited to be involved in this. Um, and there's a number of reasons why this is important. And I'll walk you through some of these uh, reasons in, in a second. So first of all, water use awareness. We want to make our customers aware of their water usage. A few years ago, we did the study just asking people, like, wh what do they think they use in the home? And 60% of the respondents said they use less than 50 gallons per day in their household or something less than that. When in fact, these same customers actually use between 228 and 480 gallons per day. We want to make them aware of how much they're using. Water budgeting. This is the ability to tell customers what they perhaps should be using based on their irrigation design, their size, how many, and how many people live in the home, and other factors. Here's an example. I'll go through this quickly. Here's a, a property, uh, actually not too far from me, but it's about an acre, and um, they have a lot of landscaping here, and this is their grass area. As we look at the square footage of the grass, and this area is their lightly irrigated shrub area. Of course, they also have a pool here. Um, we did a quick calculation of what their water budget should be based on the weather at the time and the square footage of grass and shrubs and came up with a, a, a term here that we can calculate. And from this, we generated a budget. This red line represents what they should be using. Now, bear in mind, the scale is between two and 8,000 gallons. So they're using a heck of a lot of water. But the, you can tell from the scale, they're quite a bit above their budget. Uh, in July of, this is an old study, but in July of that year, 2007, they installed an ET controller. And this is a controller that changes the amount of water based on the weather. Um, and here's their chart afterwards. They're still above budget, what they should be, but um, it actually resulted in a 42% savings. Um, we've done it, I've been around this for quite a while, and this is a map of where we've done some earlier studies, including, I mentioned the, um, the, the Badger mobile studies and uh, performance meter. Um, those are shown in, uh, those are ones where we don't have towers. We just drive out and read the meter. Uh, this release study was uh, actually done in, in 2007. That's the graph that you just saw. Um, we also did a, 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 a fixed network, I should say. These are towers, re reading the meter through towers. Um, and then, then came along Blackhawk in 2008. And we're gonna talk more about this one. Uh, and then we are here are our two um, towers for the census system that we started with. We did a leak detection and a downtown uh, a radio propagation study, and we added more towers later. Um, some uh, findings from our earlier studies, I keep hammering on this, but leaks were very important. Um, from the data, we were able to pinpoint how people were using water and uh, was it irrigation? Was there water loss? Uh, where the customer is using water continuously. We saw a range of savings from just showing customers their water usage, somewhere between five and 50% 50 per, 50 with about a 15% average amongst those that, that were able to see the data. We also found some energy savings too. But at, at this time, back in the uh, 2000s, we um, recognized the technology was still rapidly evolving, uh, not quite as, what, not as uh, much as what we have today. One of the earlier studies that we did out in Round Hill, we used it to evaluate the diurnal demand from a customer, from our customer groups, and we recognized that um, this big peak here was uh, heavy irrigation in that neighborhood. 
Uh, we were able to show customers on a laptop um, their usage by the month, day, hour, and minute. But that required an in-person visit, uh, which of course would not be allowed today. Um, and the customers all told us, hey, you know, why can't I have this on my computer screen? Um, here's an example of uh, a customer that had heavy irrigation usage and also uh, leaks going on. This was a very useful tool to explain to the customers what was going on. We also identified some meters as they were breaking. This meter was uh, had real strong consumption and then all of a sudden it stopped and then it started again and then it stopped. Um, and over the course of a year, we traced this one and noticed that this is a pretty heavy water consumer. Um, this was the year before and this was the year after. And then the customer said, I didn't change a thing. I don't know what why your bills went down. And um, it amounted to a, uh, about $3,000 in non-collected revenue. Um, we look a lot about pressure zones because we know how much water we're delivering to a pressure zone and we, we know how much water we can, we're can we selling inside the pressure zone to each meter. It obviously takes a lot of energy to lift water the higher the pressure zone that you go. And so that's important to us as far as energy savings. Uh, reducing water consumption means reducing pumping. Um, here's an example of a study we did back in 2006 comparing supply versus demand in the Hawley pressure zone. What we noticed is there was a constant, almost constant differential between what we were putting into the system and what we're selling on the meter. And this turned out to actually, there was no water spilling out onto the ground. This entirely turned out to be meter uh, accuracy at low flows. Um, so that was when we, when we uh, were able to fix a lot of the leaks that were in the system, these two gaps uh, closed up. This gap between the two. The Blackhawk project was an important project for us in the Danville uh, area of um, the Blackhawk. Um, we had about uh, we covered about ten square miles with nine collectors, and this is the first project uh, where we were um, one, actually one of the earliest of its kind, where we were able to show customers hourly water consumption online. We had a, a cool web interface that showed customers actually their their ten year history of water compared to their weather, and they were allowed to drill down. Um, to the uh, month, to the day, and um, and even to the hour. Um, in this line here is the water budget that they could establish for themselves to let them know if they exceeded a daily uh, maximum. Our current AMI project, uh, this is where I'm standing right now at the uh, AMI collector up in, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm actually not there. Um, but this is uh, the census project that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have a total of seven towers reading these meters. Um, this is what you see on the ground is a little black circle, which is our antenna. And this is the uh, one of the towers uh, out there. This one I think is uh, Los Aromos. Um, this is how the meters are installed in the ground. Um, a typical, in this case, brass bodied meter uh, with a wire coming out of it going to this is our radio Sometimes we call them erts. They're not really erts, but that's what we call them. Um, we have two projects going on right now, which are significant, uh, about a $6.4 million project uh, for about 20,000 meters in total, but 10,000 of these meters are associated with this uh, research project we're doing with UC Davis, uh, PG&E also. And about 3,000 meters are on the, uh, a Bureau of Reclamation study of the largest meters in our service area. For this study, we got a million dollar grant. Here's uh, some of the meters in those two studies. Uh, or excuse me, the yellow uh, triangles represent our collectors with these two being our original collectors and the yellow five are the ones we added. Um, we have a very complicated integration with our vendor census, uh, partly due to uh, our customer watch system not recognizing uh, the radio as an asset and so census has never dealt with that before so we have very complicated uh challenging integration and these are all the components that go into our ami system including uh, the endpoints the towers we're reading both with car and with uh, towers and uh, we're sending our data off to uh, a portal and to uc davis and it's it's gotten very complicated um the pg e study um just about out of time, uh, is interesting in that we have 5,000 customers in a treatment group um, who have the web portal and 5,000 that don't, and then 5,000 uh, control group that don't have anything. And we're trying to evaluate how much water giving customers a portal like this actually saves. 
but we're also looking at their gas and electricity bills to see if there's a spillover effect uh, from saving water. Are they also saving energy? We're looking for a very statistically significant result that we can hang our hats on and perhaps uh, use to propose uh, grants based on energy savings. Um, we also save energy from pumping less water too. The Bureau studies a little different angle and we're looking at the largest customers, factories, plants, even some residential customers that use a crazy amount of water. We're trying to just by giving this portal and talking to them, can we help them save water? Can we help them find a way to better track their, their, their water use and in turn their energy use? Uh, we have this web portal. Uh, pretty much every customer can access whether they have AMI or not. This, this site tells them about their water usage, their billing and whatnot. But by clicking on this track button here, they can un un get to the, the real good stuff, the hourly data. Here is what uh, we're showing uh, consumption on a yearly basis by the hour uh, over two months, the daily consumption. Um, let's see, we're down to the day and we can get down to the hour where the system has automatically flagged potential uh, high use, unexpected high use that might be a leak. They can also access this site on their smartphone and they can set up communication preferences to uh, let us know when they want to be emailed, texted or called if they have a problem. Uh, I'll close with this large meter project we completed up at Chevron where we changed out some old Venturi meters uh, for a new mag meter with an AMI endpoint, solar panel backup, uh, sophisticated meter. Uh, full system rollout, we only have seven collectors now covering about two thirds of our service area. But if we invested in some more collectors, we'd have full coverage at these sites. So 63 sites would, would give us the full system. With that, I'll take questions. If we're waiting for comments, Dave, I'll make one comment. You broke two records. Most slides presented. Yay! And the most people attended. We got up to 80 attendees today. So congratulations. Thank you, Shelter in Place. <laughs> <laughs> now let's see. No, no questions coming yet. Okay. Okay. There we go. Can you read that one, Dave? Um, I'll have to click that up. Uh, I can I read it to you. Good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, what were the super early meters used for, like Da Vinci during Da Vinci's time? Well, da, da Vinci never sold any of his meters. It was just a concept. But I mean, uh, back in the day, they used stream meters to measure flow in rivers, and and they would maybe sell water through a canal or, or something like that to try and figure out. Um, as I understood, uh, Frontinus' use of the meters had more to do with water quality. They actually charged more water based on how much water it was and the quality of the water. Um, but the early meters, they would just like basically throw in a stream and try and measure the flow rate that way. Let's see, any other questions? We've got time. I have a question. Go ahead. I was wondering, is there sort of, is this kind of a conflicting set of incentives for EB Mud? Because don't we also kind of want people to be using water? Because if they get, if we get too efficient at it, then our uh, income would reduce, right? Or our revenue from water, or is that sort of negligible versus the the money we save by not having to treat as much water? Or well, that's a complicated question, uh, and it's um, there's many answers to that. First of all, if we didn't have meters, didn't have conservation, we would be in dire straits. We'd be buying very expensive water. Uh, we'd have to run Freeport a, a lot. We'd have to negotiate just by by keeping our levels down at the ideal. We um, sell enough water to keep in business. We offer good customer service. And we're not we're not required to build extra expensive facilities. Uh, if we have the ability to to build smaller facilities in the future, to build smaller pipelines, smaller pumps, we actually will help keep our costs uh, manageable. So there's yes, if we don't sell any water, you know, it's going to be a problem. But we want to find the sweet spot. I hope that that answers it. Yeah, thanks. That 
that makes sense with not having to design overly. Yeah. Thanks. Let's see, we have another one, Dave. Have you had any questions about invasion of privacy concerns? I think this is related to AMI. And East Bay, East Bay Med knows when I take a shower. That, that would be an example. Yeah, they actually don't have the time to check on when, I'm not sure who asked the question, they take a shower. But to, I've been asked that question more times from presentations than I have from, I've heard from the public. I think that is more of a, a concern from people that are about to do an AMI system than the actual public. I think uh, it, there's always going to be some of that. But the fact of the matter I tell people is their water meter is typically at the street. I can tell how much water they're using just by looking at their water meter. This just makes it electronic. We don't actually open the meter anymore to look at it. And we have no interest in knowing when people use water, how they use water, just that they are using it properly. So. There's another question. How many meters are in our system right now? And what's the average age of the meter? Oh boy. So, um, it's a test so, for you, Dave. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've tried like heck to try and figure out, but we have about 400,000 meters covering uh, about 385,000 accounts. Some accounts have multiple meters. About 20,000 of those are equipped with AMI. As far as the total age goes, um, I tried like heck and others have tried to like pinpoint that down. We don't have uh, great records prior to the 70s and we have quite a lot of older meters. The uh, we, we categorize our meters by type and the single most common is the unknown. It's a manufacturer that existed um, probably prior to 1970 that they sold a ton of meters all on January 1st, 1951. Fantastic day. Uh, but all seriousness, we actually don't actually know. Um, on a, we've never been able to pinpoint. And sometimes I have trouble determining how old a meter is. Got another question on water budgeting. Um, there was a slide you showed on water budgeting, and do we currently run water budgeting for our big lot customers? Uh, we do. Uh, we offer our customers, uh, for just for information purposes, uh, for our large landscapes, we have a program called IRIS that uh, calculates uh, basically what I showed. Um, I'm looking for that chart. Uh, what I showed here. Um, uh, a calculation of what their water budget is. And unfortunately, it's it's based on monthly billing. So we kind of tell people, hey, you know, last month or two months ago, you know, you were above budget or you were below budget. With with AMI, we have the potential to to give that budget budget a much more timely, useful uh, delivery so that we can actually tell people, hey, and maybe in the future we'll be able to say tomorrow's going to be a scorcher. You might want to irrigate this morning or something to that effect. But but right now we we offer uh, uh, budgets and we have probably 20 years saying, hey, how'd you do last month based on your water budget? And it looks like that's, let's see if any more questions come in. Got a few more minutes. Okay. Wow. I think, wow, we finished on time. This another is amazing. Record. Yeah. Yeah. Another record. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, just want to thank you, Dave, for giving this presentation and for everyone showing up. Um, as always, if you have any other questions, um, give, you can feel free to contact Dave. Yeah. And with that, I'll go ahead, stop the meeting recording oh, and... I was going to say one thing. Um, I went through this pretty quick. Uh, I do have a copy of this presentation on the iDrive. If anyone uh, wants to grab a, a photo or wants to check on a graphic, uh, I send me a, a link. I'll, I'll send me an email. I'll send you the link. Great. Thank you, Dave.